so many people in Sweden are lining up, lining up to get these microchips that the country's main chipping company says that it can't even keep up with the number of requests. Really? What I'm thinking, in no the way wow. I would do that? What in the Illuminati, Mark of the Beast, <laughs> witchcraft <laughs> is going on over there in wow. Sweden? And Steve, this is happening here. I don't want to get biblical, but you know, I've heard about this Mark of the Beast business my whole life. I think it's true. I think I think biblical prophecy. The more I'm I'm hearing about this, everything we do. So we can talk about this, but this isn't coming. It's, it's already here. here. Right. But, and, and, and in China, this is the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Couldn't sleep, so I came to the church. In the middle of the night, Pastor John Gray took to Instagram to speak with his followers about the anniversary gift he gave his wife of eight years. Pastor John Gray, he leads the relentless church down in South Carolina. It's an evangelical mega church with some 22,000 members, many of whom weren't so happy when they learned of his very generous gift. This morning, outrage at the pulpit. Get that in your spirit. John Gray, a mega church pastor in Greenville, South Carolina, speaking out after facing fierce criticism for buying his wife a $200,000 Lamborghini. First of all, it wasn't a pastor that bought the car. It was a husband that bought the car. And I won't ask permission from anybody to do it. Video surfaced this week of the pastor presenting the car to his wife in celebration of their eight year wedding anniversary. But the image was soon taken down after response to the pastor went viral. Gray says the money comes from his book deals and from his reality TV show, The Book of John Gray, on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Gray is a former associate pastor at Joel Osteen's mega church in Houston. Osteen, who lives in a $10 million mansion, famous for preaching the gospel of prosperity. Gray echoing that message, saying he deserves everything he's got. This story has plenty of people talking with mixed opinions on social media. Right down on our Facebook page, David writes, I believe this is between him and God. Let us not judge him as we all, as all of our days, that is, will come to stand before Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, Donald says, my understanding is he is a New York Times bestseller. This is just like everything else. People are mad at him because they can't be him. We also have a poll right now on our Facebook page asking you what you think about that purchase. So so far, close to 11,000 people have already voted, and right now about 75% of them say that gift was inappropriate. The other 25% don't have a problem with it. Mr. Yang, has China declared war on Christianity? Yes. Fang Gong Wang, a leading expert on religion in China, says what started several years ago as a small government campaign against unregistered churches has turned into all-out war. The campaign was first experimented in Zhejiang province in 2014 to 2016. Now it has become a nationwide campaign. A campaign where authorities routinely target houses of worship, destroy crosses, burn Bibles, and arrest pastors. On December 9th, authorities in the city of Chengdu arrested prominent Christian pastor Wang Yi along with his wife and 100 members of Early Rain Covenant Church. Authorities shut down the church and charged Pastor Wang with inciting subversion of state power. He and his wife could face up to 15 years in prison if convicted. Well, Chinese authorities have developed a new surveillance tool. It's called the Gate Recognition. It's a software that can identify people using their body shapes and how they walk, even if your face is hidden from a camera. This is already, in fact, being used by police in China, and it's raising a lot of concerns about how far this technology will go and how deep will this deep brother uh, the thing go in the country. Another thing they have is called the social credit system, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't allow you to be a bad citizen. It's going to go into place in 2020, but already I've read that they've generated 7 million punishments. So 
this is this is sort of the scary stuff we it, we've read about it for a long time, but it's coming into existence. Yeah, I think this is new totalitarianism, and we've got to put this in a historical context. I mean, you can imagine what this kind of technology would be used under a Lenin or a Mao. Um, unfortunately, the trajectory of human rights and freedom in China is going the wrong way. We've seen Xi Jinping in many ways take a pl uh, plays out of Mao's playbook. Um, so I think this is incredibly disturbing. Improving lives, increasing connectivity across the world. That's the great promise offered by data-driven technology. Stop killing our children! Stop killing our children! But in China, it also promises greater state control and abuse of power. This is the next groundbreaking development in data-driven technology, facial recognition. And in China, you can already withdraw cash, check in at airports, and pay for goods using just your face. The country is the world's leader in the use of this emerging technology. And China's many artificial intelligence startups are determined to keep it that way in the future. Companies like Yi Tu, We are pioneering artificial intelligence research and innovation in the hope of creating a safer, faster, and healthier world. Yi Tu is creating the building blocks for a smart city of the future, where facial recognition is part of everyday life. This could even extend to detecting what people are thinking. Facial recognition they can read people's emotions and uh, we are actually now working on these innovative demonstrations and technology. But the Chinese government has plans to use this new biometric technology to cement its authoritarian rule. The country has ambitious plans to develop a vast national surveillance system based on facial recognition. It'll be used to monitor its 1.4 billion citizens in unprecedented ways. With the capability of tracking everything from their emotions to their sexuality. What you buy, how you spend your time, uh, if you jaywalk, if you smoke on a train, if you criticize the government, uh, even a family of friends, I mean, this is... The, oh, the, it's oh, it's going to track what apps you're on on your phone. It, it, it is big brother writ large and if you think about the steps that Venezuela, Russia and China are taking to implement their own cryptocurrencies, by 2020 I suspect they will be able to track their citizens every economic move. I mean, the, the, the disparagement of economic freedom, of personal liberty, I mean, just when you think that China is so so strong and it clamps down so much, if there's an economic slowdown coming, they're going to have to maintain social order. Thousands of people in Sweden have opted to trade in their ID and their credit cards for tiny microchips that would be implanted like underneath their skin. Yeah, these chips are supposed to take the place of key cards, rail cards, credit cards. The chips are typically the size of a grain of rice and are implanted just under the skin between the thumb and forefinger. So many Swedes are lining up to get the microchips that the country's main chipping company says it can't keep up with the number of requests. The future is a wave of a hand away. In case you missed it, here it is again. This is a whole new level of security. No keys or access cards, difficult to steal and copy, but the technology requires a certain level of commitment that's not for the faint-hearted. So this is where the microchip implant story begins, for those who want them at least. Um, banking, security, uh, general users, so contactless payments, passport data, all could be stored on these microchips and embedded in your hand. It comes down to convenience, I suppose, for a lot of people. It's very hard to lose your hand. This is one of several implant firms reportedly in discussions with British financial and legal companies. The names of the companies are being closely guarded. worries microchipping could eventually become the new normal. 
Societies embrace the mobile phone, making us easy to track on a daily basis. But by implanting microchips, there may be few places left to truly escape from technology. But I'm just not even feeling comfortable. No. But I, although there's microchips in pets, so I mean, it's not yeah. unheard of, you know. Yeah. But I have a close friend who's actually a TV meteorologist in Sweden. I actually need to give her a call about to that. Talk I to her. want to find out if that really is. Yeah, why don't you do a little like Skype? Yeah. I want to learn more. Any signs you think that someday we may have to grapple with these issues too? I, I believe mm -hmm. at some point we may, maybe not to this degree, but it's a technology that looks it would look enticing to a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're all creeped out a little bit about what Facebook and Google can do. Last week, the journal Science published a study by Vanderbilt University Medical Center. It advocates for the creation, get this, of a universal nationwide DNA database, including you and me and everybody else. The study advocates for uh, the United States to also join the ranks of the UK, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait all countries that have been fiddling with this idea of creating this type of super system with genetic information from every and all societies. This study also submits that building this universal DNA database, you know that swab thing that they send you that we've all done or sometimes police ask you to do, would actually result in more privacy. Now if to you that sounds counterintuitive, you're certainly not alone. Because maybe what we should be asking is, where is that swab I gave for my DNA test going? Who has it? What are they doing with it? Who are they sharing it with? What could be the world's first designer babies. That's the claim of a Chinese researcher who says that he created gene-edited twins. Overnight, an astonishing and dubious claim. A scientist in China saying he created the world's first genetically engineered babies. Two beautiful little Chinese girls named Lulu and Lala came crying into the world as healthy as any other baby. Technology to genetically edit human embryos has been around for a while, but scientists were unwilling to cross that ethical line until now. I believe family need this technology and I'm willing to take the criticism for them. The university where the researcher has worked is calling for an investigation saying he has been on unpaid leave and officials were unaware of the research project and its nature. So creating these genetically modified babies, allegedly, that happened is being called dangerous and unethical. And with this story, it's not a question of when, whether this could be done at all. It's a question of if, when, why, and how. And let me just tell you what we're talking about. It's a technique called CRISPR, gene editing. You take a strand of DNA, which codes for genes, mm -hmm. and this CRISPR actually works like a scissors, removes the gene, and then this DNA heals itself. So whatever this gene codes for, a disease, a condition, in theory, maybe even other things like hair color, is now gone. If they really understood the full consequences of what was being done. That's amazing. One person making a decision to affect One person yeah. changing the genetic code of the human race. For generations. For generations. It's helping them to identify wanted suspects in real time. What worries some people here is that as the technology develops, so too does the capacity for it to be abused. Already the authorities are using facial recognition to name and shame citizens even for minor offences like jaywalking. And, and in China, this is the tip of the proverbial iceberg because their plan is that by 2021, they're going to have 600 million cameras all over the country. Every citizen, <laughs> seriously, every citizen will be tracked. I know this. And, and they're going to be given a, a score 
They're going to be given a behavioral score, and if the yes. if the score is good, if you act good, you get perks like better transit, better transportation, better hospital, a gym membership. If you're bad, you get put on a blacklist and you suffer uh, problems with travel and other other issues. Steve, I mean, that's Steve, all, as Orwellian as it gets. This is this is going on now. In fact, have you ever noticed here in New York City, where where I am and and you are, do you know that whenever there is any murder anywhere, any suspect, we always have a picture of him. And nobody ever says, wait a minute, are there cameras on every corner? Yes. And let me also tell you something. For those of you who are trying to get your credit scores okay, you know, your FICO and this FICO and Equifax, <laughs> there are going to be new algorithms, seriously, that are going to base your credit worthiness, not so much on your payment history and all of the usual factors, but who your friends are, how long you are online. Do you ever get anything from Apple, which I do, that says, here's your productivity. This is how long you've been either on your phone or wasting your time. Steve, this is not the future. We live in a 24-7 real-time panopticon. We are watched every step of the way. And what scares me even more, is not that we're talking about this, but that the newer generations who were born in captivity don't have any appreciation no. for this thing and, that you called Orwellian, this dystopian horror story that's been written. And, and, and that that's great. Now. That is a great, seriously, all kidding aside, born into captivity or born in ca captivity, that is a great way to put it. His sermons, many of them widely circulated on social media, soon made him a rising star and an important player in the Christian revival that was sweeping China. All that has come to a screeching halt with his arrest and the closure of the church. Still, members of his congregation vowed to keep meeting despite the risk of arrest. Without checks and balances, China will keep finding new ways to violate the human rights of its citizens. What's already happening in Xinjiang is a warning the rest of the world must heed.